Hello and hi, welcome to the Express Halakha series. My name is Yedidia Shofet. We are on num- number six. We're beginning with the laws of Shema Yisrael. This is chapter 15 in our book. Halakha number one. The Shema should be, re- should be read with reverence and concentration because it enunciates the concept of monotheism. When you say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. When you say that, listen, O Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, God is our Lord, Hashem Echad, God is only one, you're completely admitting to the fact there's only one God. Halacha number two, one must be aware of its meaning, and the words must be articulated correctly, because if you don't know what it means, it's questionable if one had fulfilled his obligation. Halacha number three, it is important that the whole congregation join the Chazan for the recitation of the first verse. If one comes late and he sees a congregation are about to recite the Shema, he should join in with them, so as not to appear to be rejecting the Shema Yisrael, the yoke of the Kingdom of Heaven. But of course, it depends, as we say, as we will learn later on, if you're in the middle of uh, different prayers, you may not be able to answer. Halacha number four. After the first verse, when you say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, you should say the words Baruch Shem Kevon Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed, which is basically Blessed be His name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. And you should do this quietly. But on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, you must recite this Baruch Shem Kevon Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed, just as loud as you would say Shema Yisrael. Halacha number five. When reciting the last verse of the third paragraph, beginning with Vayomer, one must have in mind the departure of our forefathers from Egypt, because that deals with everything that has to do with uh, finding a uh, salvation when you're leaving a, a difficult time in your life, especially with our ancestors who were in Egypt. That's why it's so important to actually think while you pray. At the conclusion of the Shema, some Sephardi communities have the custom to add the word emet, when you say, Ani Hashem Elohechem, and the Chazan repeats, Hashem Elohechem, Emet. Other communities have the custom not to add the word Emet, and this is done only by the Chazan after he repeats Hashem Elohechem, and each community should observe its own custom. Just to let you know, our communities, we usually say everything. We say Hashem Elohechem, Emet, and then we repeat it again. Number seven, a person who prays on his own without a minyan is allowed to repeat Hashem Elokechem Emet. Now, why is this such an important halacha? Because the uh, Shema Yisrael, it has an exact number of words that correspond to the different limbs of a person's body. If you add more or you detract, then it's not corresponding anymore. However, when you say Hashem Elokechem Emet, it's still corresponding with the person's limbs. It's still corresponding with the special tefillah that we say. Halacha number eight. The tefillin should be kissed at the appropriate places, as we mentioned before. Anytime when you talk about uh, on your hearts or uh, on enechem, your eyes, when you talk about those two, you should kiss your tefillin. Similarly, the tzitzit should be kissed when they are mentioned in the third paragraph of Shema. Halacha number nine. The the time for reciting the Shema in the morning, it starts from when it is light enough to recognize an acquaintance at a distance of about six feet. Meaning, if you want to know whether or not you could say Shema Yisrael, go outside, look around, see if you could recognize someone from a distance. This is without, of course, street lights. And the, the time for saying the Shema, it extends until the end of the first quarter of daylight hours. Now, there are many calendars which you can look at and you'll know exactly when is the first quarter. But let's say if you have eight hours in a day, uh, because, uh, uh, for instance, you're looking at eight o'clock to four o'clock is daytime. And that is the, that is how you look at it, meaning from sunrise to sunset. So from the, from sunrise, you take a quarter of that day, and let's say it's the first two hours, then that would mean that from the first two hours, from sunrise 
you would have to say Shema Yisrael as well as its blessings. That's the most pristine time for you to say Shema Yisrael. If, however, that time has passed, the Shema and its benedictions can still be said on a third of the day. After this time, uh, one should not say the blessings anymore of Shema Yisrael, and rather he should recite Shema until at least midday. A blind man, halacha number 12, a blind man must say Shema Yisrael, even though when it talks about the tzitzit, it says, and you will see them. Now this, because it's a general tefillah that we are saying. Halacha number 13. Women are exempt from the recitation of Shema, as this is a positive commandment with a fixed time. Since we have to be able to say Shema within either a quarter or a third of a day, and some even say until midday, and then afterwards it loses its potency in terms of uh, reciting it at the correct time, so therefore women are exempt, as we talked about this that time bound mitzvot on a woman is not uh, it's not pressed. Nevertheless, it is advisable that they should recite the first verse of Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, because that is not a time bound. You can say that always, and therefore you can always accept the yourself or themselves the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. However, if they wish to recite the entire Shema. They may do so, because we know that women, if they do wish to say tefillot, they may say any part of the tefillah. According, number 14, according to the Rishon Letzion, Harav Ovadi Yosef, Zechar Tzadik Livracha, may his soul rest in peace. Women are exempt from the benedictions of the Shema. Basically, the blessings before Shema, women do not need to say them because they're time-bound. If, however, they wish to say them, they may do so. But they should say it where God's name is omitted. For instance, you should say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam. And that way, it will be better. Or just say, Baruch Yotzer Or Uvorech Hoshech. Again, instead of saying, Baruch Atah Hashem, HaBocher Ba'amo Yisrael Ba'ava, you should say, Baruch HaBocher Ba'amo Yisrael Ba'ava. And after Shema, when they say, Baruch Atah Hashem Ga'al Yisrael, you should say, Baruch Ga'al Yisrael. Now, some communities, they just say everything. They say Hashem's name, and it depends on which community you are. Now we jump into the next halakha, and that is the halachot of the Amidah. The 18 blessings. This is the special Amidah. It's a silent prayer that we say to ourselves, and it encapsulates the entire idea of what it means to praise, to have petition, and in order to give thanks to God for everything that He gives to us. Now let's read. Halacha number 1, chapter 16. <clears throat> it is a positive commandment to pray every day to Hashem, and it is ri- as is, it is written in uh, Devarim, and you shall serve Him with all your heart. Number 2. In the olden days, each person would formulate his own tefillah according to his ability. And whenever he wanted to pray, He would just make the tefillah as he would uh, feel is correct, as long as it had three criteria. One, it would be the criteria of praise. Two, it would be the criteria of petition, basically uh, beseeching and asking God. And three, it would be a criteria of saying thanks, in a more elaborate way, of course. This was the custom from the time of Moses until Ezra HaSofer, Ezra the scribe. However... After the destruction of the first temple, the men of the great assembly, basically the Anshe Knesset Agidola, they formulated set prayers as they saw that, the, uh, that Hebrew was no longer fluent among the Jewish population and no one was able to pray correctly, especially to put all their words in the exact requests that are necessary. Halacha number three. The rabbis instituted the law that a person should pray three times a day. Shacharit, the morning service, Mincha, the afternoon service, and Arvit, the evening service. For Shabbat, festivals, and Rosh Chodesh, basically the beginning of the month, they added a special Musaf prayer, an additional service, an additional Amida. For Yom Kippur, they added another prayer, which is called the Ne'ila. Basically, at the end of uh, Yom Kippur, you say an extra Amida as well makes it a total of five services on that day. Halacha number five. 
the Amida, otherwise known as the Shemona Esre, the 18 blessings, originally consisted of 18 benedictions. As a result of the proliferation of informers and apostates among Israel, basically people who tried to go against Israel, the rabbis added a further benediction, praying for their elimination. There are now, therefore, a total of 19 benedictions in the Amidah. Basically, we call it Shemona Esrei, we call it the 18 blessings, but they're really 19 blessings, because one blessing is as a request in order to make sure that we could continue our tefillot to God. Number six, before reciting the Amidah, one should reflect on the Divine Presence. One should banish mundane thoughts from one's mind. It's hard, but we have to try. One should consider that if one were in the presence of a king, one would surely concentrate on one's words. How much more so than one who is standing in front of the Supreme King of Kings, who examines all thoughts and deeds. It's a scary thought, but we have to try. Halacha number seven. The time for the morning, Shemona Esrei, basically when you do the Amidah in the morning, is from sunrise until a third of the day has elapsed. In cases of necessity, one may say the Amidah is dawn, basically an hour before sunrise. And the latest one may say it is until midday. If one is unable to pray before the midday, then the prayer must be compensated for the at the afternoon service, meaning if you weren't able to say the tefillah in the morning, you will have to compensate it later after midday with the other tefillot as we will go through later on. Halacha number eight. Prior to starting the Amidah, one should stand with one's feet together and one's hands crossed, not crossed in a Christian way, but actually uh, one hand on top of the other. For instance, the right hand over the left, like a servant before his master. Halacha number nine. The worshiper should face eastwards, towards the land of Israel. If circumstances prevent this, then he should always direct his thoughts to the Almighty. It is advisable that there should be no movable object, such as a chair or a table between oneself and the wall at the time of prayer. However, if these objects are permanently placed and they are positioned always in such an area, don't worry about it. You may pray over there. For instance, if you're praying uh, in a, in, on a bima or a table that they usually have in a synagogue, don't worry about this. Halacha number 11. One may not pray in front of a picture, but if one unavoidably does so, then he should close his eyes so that he is not distracted from his prayer. But... He cannot do this in front of a mirror, basically a reflective mirror. Why? Because even with one's eyes closed, this can be seemed or deemed by others that he is praying to himself, to his own image. Halacha number 12. One may not support oneself while reciting the Amidah. He shouldn't be leaning it on anything. But if, of course, if he is ill or he is unable to stand, he may do so. If necessary, the Amidah may be said sitting down or even lying on one side if he is that ill. Halacha number 13. If one is traveling in a car, a boat, or an airplane, and it is possible to stand to say the Amidah, he should do so. But if not, he may, it may be recited sitting down. Because as we know, if one stands up, it will cause a major uh, traffic on uh, on an airplane, for instance, the aisles, and will cause a big chilul Hashem, desecration of God's name, he should just sit and pray exactly where he is. Halacha number 14. During the recitation of the Amidah, one should have one's eyes closed unless he's looking in a sidur, because this will enhance concentration. Number 15. One must not be under the influence of alcohol while praying, because he will not have any concentration. Number 16, he who recites the Amidah aloud implies by his action that God is unaware of silent prayer. Therefore, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of the Jewish Law rules, one should pray so quietly that only he himself can hear the words that is coming out of his mouth. Some, however, advise that if he can still concentrate, he should pray even without hearing himself. Because God can hear you no matter how loud or how silent you can pray. 
One must bow, number 17, one must bow four times during the Amidah. At the start of the Amidah, when one says the, uh, when one begins to say the blessing, blessed art thou. And when this, and when this benediction is concluded with, blessed art thou, O Lord, the shield of Avraham, the blessing of Magen Avraham, he should bow again. And then by Modim Anachnulach, when we give thanks, he should bow again. And then when he says uh, the final blessing, the second of, uh, final blessing, he should, uh, Blessed art thou, O Lord, good is thy name, unto thee is fitting to give thanks, Tov lo dot. He should bless again. What should not bow down at any other benediction mentioned in the Amidah? Basically, he has to only make sure to bow down in those four places. Again, if you have any questions about anything, please do not hesitate to ask. An old person or a sick man who finds it difficult to bow needs only to incline his head. Number 19. At the end of the silent Amidah, before reciting, one takes three steps backwards, beginning with the left foot. One remains standing in this position and only returns to one's place when the Chazan is about to recite the Kedusha of Nakdishach or Keter. Basically when everyone says Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh together. One should remain where one is at least until the Chazan begins a repetition of the Amidah. Number 20. If another person is reciting the Amidah behind another, then it is correct to wait until he finishes before taking the three steps backwards. Meaning, if there are two people, and you finish your tefillah, but there's someone behind you, wait until he finishes, and then walk backwards. Halakha number 21. One may not sit in front of one who is saying the Amidah, unless the person who is sitting down, is also engaged in prayer. It is therefore advisable for a sick or elderly person who has to sit down to engage himself in prayer or the study of the Torah. So what does this mean? That if someone needs to pray, he should uh, he should understand not to engage within the distance of someone else who is praying. But if someone who is sick or is older and he has to sit, he should sit down. It will be easier for him to pray, easier for everyone else to pray. Number 22, women are also subject to the positive mitzvah of prayer. However, unlike men, they are only obligated to pray once a day. However, if they wish to recite the three daily amidot, the three daily uh, shemona esres, they may do so. And the final halacha of the day, in Talmudical times, apart from the required prayers of arvit, shacharit, and mincha, those three prayers, one can pray amida at any time, as a nidava, a free will prayer, the equivalent of a free will offering in the temple. However, nowadays free will prayers is not permitted, except when one is in doubt as to whether one has prayed or not, or whether one has fulfilled one's obligation in regard to a particular prayer. Therefore, in these circumstances, one should say to oneself before commencing the prayer, if I have not prayed, then this prayer will be a required prayer. And if I have prayed, then this prayer is to be considered as a free will prayer. Basically, this tefillah will enable him in order to uh, connect for tefillot that he is not able to, that he wasn't able to actually connect before. Bezerat Hashem, we will continue with more uh, halachot regarding the Amidah in the next series. Thank you.